morning to all of you. Welcome to our online worship of the Filipino Ministry of Valley Baptist Church. So welcome to our regular tenders, regular members, and those who have been with us for the past few weeks, and those who are first time joining us. Again, welcome. Such a good opportunity to uh, have this uh, time to be able to come to the comforts of your living room and have fellowship, at least virtually, and then pray, sing, and hear God's Word. But today, uh, before we start, let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this wonderful uh, opportunity, Lord God, to worship your name. Thank you, Lord, that in spite of what is happening we are experiencing here, uh, we still have the chance to go before your throne, join with one another, be gathered in spirit, at least through the computers to the uh, online stuff and we are able to go before your throne and worship your name it is such a good thing to come before the presence of our god and even now may you inhabit our praise lord thank you for everything we worship you we love you in jesus name amen amen, amen. good morning dear brothers and sisters we are so glad that you are here to worship the lord our god we know that god is also glad and He is pleased when He hears our songs of praise and thanksgiving. Psalm 69, 30-31 says, I will praise the name of God with a song, and will magnify Him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bull which has horns and hooves. Do you know that there came a time in the lives of the Israelites when they have lost the meaning of burnt offerings? They just did it mechanically and even offered defective animals. So, instead of them enjoying the presence of God, they resented it. And you know, God knew, and He knows right now. He sees beyond what we do on the outside, and He knows the motives that we have on the inside. So, let us search our hearts and pray for grace to make us sincere. Let us sing in gratitude and humility, and give our best as we worship Him. This song is based on Isaiah 60 verses 1 and 2, where God is encouraging His people. He says, Arise, shine for your light has come, for behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and His glory will be seen upon you. So let us all arise and praise Him. Shine and celebrate it. Praise 
all over the earth no matter what and we are his ambassadors to represent him here on earth he gave us the bible and his holy spirit to empower and guide us he said in john 16:33, these things i have spoken to you that in me you might have peace in this world you shall have tribulations or sufferings but be of good cheer i have overcome the world and since we belong to jesus we are also overcomers. Amen? Amen. First John 5, 4 says, For everyone born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Let us sing with conviction, meaning every word. i 
Scripture reading, Genesis 50, verses 15 through 21. I will read the first verse, and please read the second verse and following verses with Pastor Dennis as your guide. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, Perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph, saying, before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we are your servants. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, when God meant it for good, in order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. Let us read together. Now therefore, do not be afraid, I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. May the Lord bless his word in our hearts and prepare our hearts as we listen to his message. Good morning, family and friends and our online visitors who have been joining us for a couple of weeks. Or if this is your first time to join us here online, again, thank you and welcome. Thank you for welcoming, welcoming us in your living room or wherever you are, uh, for giving us the chance to be able to share the gospel or the word of God to you. You know, the, the other day I was just looking at Facebook and I saw this cartoon of the devil talking with God. And the devil said, hey God, I closed up a lot of your churches. And then God replied, hey devil, I opened up a lot of services at home. And that's what we're uh, having today, worshiping God in the convenience of your own home. So you see, worship continues every Sunday. And this setup here illustrates that church is not the building. 
church is the people. And as a matter of fact, I would like to encourage you to share this video to your friends, to your loved ones, to your family, and to the people that you would like to join, at least in spirit, join with us in the online service. You know, ito pong set up natin, somehow technology helps us. I This week, I had two Zoom fellowship with uh, a couple of pastors, one with the Filipino pastors, and the other one would be with the, uh, was with the Kern County pastors. One of the Filipino pastors told us about his story he's doing online. One of his members shared the online video to a congregation back in the Philippines, in Benguet. And, and for a couple of weeks now, they have been watching his online video. And it's a blessing because it so happened that this church don't, don't have a pastor as of the moment. So they have their feeding spiritually weekly coming from abroad. I mean, isn't that convenient? You know, one of the current county pastor also shared to us that his neighbor who has been just across their church, not attending their church, but somehow the lockdown situation, they were able to send them an online video and their neighbor reported, thank you, we are enjoying the online service. So somehow the Lord used this. I myself have my own story. You see, um, aside from the texts that I got from our members and regular attendants thanking us for this online video, I also got texts from our friends and visitors, people that I have met in the supermarket, in the grocery for a couple of years ago, months ago, I got their number and I have been sending them this link that we have online video. They didn't have the chance to join us during our regular time at worship service, but somehow they are able to join us online and they are also texting me almost like every week, thanking us that we are able to send them our online video. So to, uh, to you, our friends, thank you very much. As long as we can do this, as long as the Lord gives us the power, then we will continue to invite you and send you our online worship. So today, I would like to invite you to open your Bible on the book of Genesis. This is the last chapter of the book of Genesis, and next week we will be moving on to studying the book of Exodus. And I have been doing a book series, but somehow I kind of noticed as I studied it, there is somehow a significant lesson that has still relevance in our current situation, like today. The title of our message today is God. God meant it for good. God meant it for good. Somehow from the title itself, it kind of have that hint of relevance in our current situation. Now allow me to give you a recap of where our sermon series uh, are right now. In Genesis 48 and 49, Jacob in his deathbed blessed his grandchildren, particularly blessed the sons of Joseph, and then in 49, he blessed his 12 sons, the tribes of Israel, and then in Genesis 50, he dies. It was time for him to rest. It was time for him to meet his maker. It was time to uh, rest from his life that was marked with pains, suffering, death threats, but eventually marked with bliss, fulfillment, love, respect, and honor. And this is what we read in Genesis chapter 50, verse 2. Jacob already died. And in verse 2, Genesis 52, And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. So Joseph asked the physician to embalm his father. He didn't ask. These are medical men who are capable of doing embalming. He didn't ask the religious embalmers of Egypt to avoid magic and mysticism associated with their practice. And he was allowed, or it was a requirement that the embalming requires 40 days. The body of Jacob is soaked with ointment, cedar, myrrh, and cinnamon. Genesis 50 verse 3, 40 days were required for him, for such are the days required for those who are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him, 70 days. So 40 days, it was a, a requirement for the Egyptian culture. And after 40 days, that's the only time that he 
they were allowed to conduct a funeral for him in Canaan. Now look at Joseph, second command in the land, but still he observed the law. He submitted to the law. And after this um, embalming period, that's the time he actually asked a servant to ask permission to Pharaoh. Imagine, he did not demand. He asked permission from Pharaoh if he can bury his father in Canaan because that was the request of his father mentioned to him uh, when he was still alive. So here is Jacob now going to Canaan about to bury his father. You could notice there's a remarkable number of delegation accompanying him. Pharaoh himself commanded his servants to join and help Joseph. Maybe he thinks that the father of the second in command of Egypt is worthy to be treated with such respect. So here they are in Canaan, joined in with a lot of people, a lot of delegation, all of Pharaoh's servants, all the elders of the house of the Jews, all the elders of the land of Egypt, the house or the family of Joseph, his brothers, and Jacob's house. You know, that's they are in Canaan about to bury jo Jacob. And the inhabitants of the land saw this great number. And, you know, they, they talk. Wow, look at this uh, great number of people. They might have thought this is an Egyptian burial. And they, they're talking about uh, among themselves, man, this could be, this might be a very great man. And, and the event they also commemorated by changing the name of the place, Abel Mizraim. Isn't it sometimes here in the United States, we see roads uh, commemorated to a police officer, to a certain person, to give them honor. In a way, that was that's that what happened to Jacob. If Jacob were alive, he never dreamed that he would be buried in such grandeur, in such dignity, attended by a lot of people. You know, this lowly serve or this lowly shepherd in Canaan only had one desire. He just wants his remains to be together with his father, with his fathers, with his, with his mothers, with his forefathers, with his wife. But God gave him something extra, a burial that's fitted for a king. Now all this, it was God's doing. All this, God meant it to be this way. You know, before Jacob died, before he went to Egypt, before he desired, learning that his long-lost son is still alive, before he wanted to you reunited with him, he first went to Beersheba to offer sacrifices to God, to pray, to seek counsel. Beersheba, what's the significance of Beersheba, you know, it's not a tourist spot. It's an unassuming place used by God to shape a lot of significant lives in the Bible. Abraham paid seven ewe lambs to buy a well. Isaac fought for this well, and uh, that's in Beersheba. In the Bible, Beersheba is found in somewhere on the southern part of Canaan. It's like the border already, the outer rims. That's why you will find expression in the Bible like from Dan to Beersheba. So it's talking about the, you know, the perimeter or the scope. So when they said people coming out from Dan to Beersheba, it talks about the totality of the land of Canaan. And in Beersheba, it's also a point of departure, a spiritual journey to a lot of people, namely Abraham. Hagar, Elijah, and now Jacob, that when they go to Beersheba, it's like um, a spiritual journey for them. So Jacob, he was about to have another spiritual journey from Canaan going to Egypt. He goes to Be Beersheba to pray. If you are going to look at the life of Jacob, his choices, his family, um, his decisions, it's not really an ideal Christian home. But however, his heart is marked with dependence on God. And the reason why he went to Beersheba is to seek God's counsel. Genesis 46, 2-4. Let me read that to you. Then God spoke to Israel 
in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here I am. So he said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not fear to go down to Egypt, for I will make of you a great nation there. I will go down with you to Egypt, and I will also surely bring you up again, and Joseph will put his hand on your eyes. Principle number one, our prayer life reveals a great deal about our trust in God. Our prayer life reveals a great deal about our trust in God. When we say we believe in God, but we don't pray a lot, then it says much about our faith in God. As a matter of fact, people who have faith in God, they pray a lot. And let us also talk about the type of prayer that we do. The type of prayer also tells us about the kind of faith we have. Okay, the kind of faith that you have. Do you pray hoping to be heard or you pray because you are being heard? Matthew 6, 7 says here, And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. You see, it was the, in the opinion of the heathens that when they see, when they say things again and again and again, it's their opinion that God will hear them. You know, it might be effective to some relationship, husband and wife's relationship. You keep on repeating same message again and again, but then if one of you already decided, I will not listen, it doesn't matter how many times you repeat a message again and again. But God is not like that. Verse 8. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask Him. God is a listener. He already knows uh, what our prayers are before we even open our mouth. Now, another principle that we can derive from the example of Jacob seeking God's counsel is this. Our prayer life reveals our submission towards God's will. When you pray, try to qualify, listen to quality of your prayers. Does it have a lot of, Lord, thy will be done? Or, Lord, let your glory, uh, let your name be glorified in this thing. Not my will, but your will. And when you pray that, are you as at peace with those kind of prayers? And if you are, then you are expressing your trust towards God's will. Somewhere in your mind, God is doing His part. But if your prayer contains something like, Why did you do this, Lord? Or why me, Lord? Why now, Lord? It says a, a lot about our trust and submission to God's will. Brothers and sisters, it's not wrong to ask God. God. It's not wrong to ask questions from Him. But there are some questions that are expressions of defiance. Some, but there are some questions that are truly seeking His will, seeking for His direction, and seeking for His answer. As a matter of fact, in today's message, when we say God meant it for good, it's an expression of an attitude of acceptance over everything that happens in this earth. You know, we may not understand everything that's happening, but we know somewhere, one way or the other, that God has a purpose and a will on everything. And we see it in the life of, in the life of Jacob and in his death. He never meant to be buried that way, but somewhere in his life, he has lots of pitfalls, but he is just continuously trusting God. So here he is, Joseph. Jacob, after his burial, Joseph, together with the other delegations, with the family, they went back to Egypt. And then something strange happened, specifically with the brothers of Joseph. Could be during the burial time or the moment they arrived in Egypt. They were thinking of in themselves, Father is gone now. Now Joseph will exact his revenge on us. Nobody will defend us from him. This is what they said in Genesis 
50, 15 to 17. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, Perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. So they sent messengers to Joseph saying, Before your father died, he commanded, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the, of the God of your father. Let me just stop there. Because of their fear, they fabricated a story that there is some kind of a secret message done by Jacob meant for Joseph to hear, to hear, to tell him that please forgive your brothers for their wrongdoing, so on and so forth. Now, of course, there was no message from Jacob before he died. We know that. Because if there was, the question is, why is it relayed after his death? He could have done that while he was still living, if that's what they want. If they wanted Jacob to defend them, Jacob could have called Joseph and, you know, mediated for them and defended them. But the truth is, there was no message from Jacob. As a matter of fact, they might not, they might not have told Jacob everything about what they did to their brother Joseph. Jacob might have died without knowing what happened to Joseph. And most of all, maybe Joseph might have told his father, but they told, let's just keep it a secret. But most of all about Joseph, Joseph would not do that to them because Joseph truly has forgiven them. Amen? What was his reaction to the news? Verse 17, And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. He wept. His heart was broken for them. At that moment, he learned that they have been living in fear through all those many, many years. Principle number three. Our fears at times are the result of our failure to trust in God's sovereignty. Their fear was the result of them not seeing God involved in this whole equation, in everything that has happened to them. They failed to see that God was working in their lives. There are people we know right now that have this strange fear in everything, in something, you know, everything is doing good, prayers are being answered, relationships are good, the debt, the debt is being paid, health is getting better, but somehow they feel, wow, God abandoned me. They still have those feelings in spite of the many good things that have happened. They don't see God working. So how did Joseph dealt with them? He reassured them with God's sovereignty. This is what he said, verse 19. Joseph said to them, said to them, Do not be afraid, for I for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. He said, you meant evil, but God meant it for good. Notice, this is like now the second time, in a way, Joseph repeated the same message to them. The first time was when they discovered that he was their brother. They were buying from the person whom they threw out, and whom they sold to slavery a couple of years ago. Let's have a recap. Genesis 45. Verse 5. This is what he said the moment he revealed himself to his brother. But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourself, because you sold me here, for God sent me before you, to preserve life. Verse 8. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh, 
and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. So he repeats it to them. He feels like he need, uh, he needs to. He feels like they needed to be reminded. Look at our situation right now. Mentally, we might understand this phrase. We can say, you know, God meant it for good. He has a purpose. That's our mind talking, but what about our heart? How does our heart respond to this? Whenever we say it, do we say it resenting God? Or do we say it deriving peace from God? This event that we're having right now, I have already heard a lot of good stories. Some families would say, you know, during this lockdown, our family got closer. I got closer with my husband. I got closer with my with my wife, with my family, with my friends. Hey, do you know we became more prayerful? We became more trusting in the Lord. God uses this thing to reveal something good. As a matter of fact, we God might also use it to reveal something that we didn't realize we have. We thought, for example, the event revealed to you the quality of your faith. All the while you thought you have faith in God, then this situation comes. Or whatever problem comes, God somehow revealed to you that the faith you thought was giving to him was actually a faith on something else other than God. And God said, this is good that you know. The word good is not our definition of good. It's God's definition of good. So if this COVID virus somehow reveals a truth that you thought was truth, and God revealed it to be false, then it's good for God because it means it's not yet too late to change. Do something about it. If this situation somehow made some problems surface in a relationship, then God use it to shake something to get our attention. It is good in the eyes of God because we are given a chance to save something that needs to be saved, to make us grow, to make us wiser. As compared to a relationship, there are relationship that we know of suddenly got destroyed. Both parties don't even have an idea what happened. They don't even know what to learn from it. That's a dilemma in our vocabulary that's not good. But God can use something good about this situation. In the case of Joseph, he didn't know the dilemma his brothers were undergoing until their father died. Now he knows. So in the eyes of God, it's good. It's time for them to be reassured. It's time for them to further grow in their faith. And it's time for Joseph to further exercise his love for his brothers. Last principle. Faith in God's sovereignty helps in loving others. Joseph's heart. He settled it a long, long time ago. That in everything that happens to him, God has a purpose. So early in his life, a lot of bad things happened. He was hated by his brothers. His brothers sold him to slavery. He became a servant at Potiphar's house. And then later on, he even got accused of rape. And look at this. The context of that, he was trying to maintain his integrity, trying to be clear. He was practicing social distancing from Potiphar's wife. But nonetheless, he still got accused of rape. You know, how annoying or irritating or disappointing is that? I mean, I, for lack of a better word, he got imprisoned for a, for a crime he did not commit. And talk about the public embarrassment attached to that because according to the scriptures, there were no uh, witnesses. So they will just take the word of Mrs. Potiphar. In prison, he helped a butler uh, renew his faith on the leadership, told him, Hey, remember me, have a good word for Pharaoh. What happened? He was forgotten. In the life of Joseph, he had all the reason to hate people. He had all the reason to seclude himself from humanity. He had all the reason to hate God. But he has put his faith 
in God's sovereignty. And because of that, he made it through his personal crisis. It did not affect his dealing with people. It did not affect his relationship with people. It did not affect his love for his brothers. As a matter of fact, if you look at his position at that time, he was even more powerful than Potiphar, his first uh, master, the one who put him in jail. And at this point, he can actually punish his brothers, his brothers who sold him to slavery, his brothers who caused a lifetime of anguish in their father's heart. But what was his response? His response was love and compassion. He said, God meant it for good. All his sad experiences, God used to mold his heart so that when this time came, he can respond in love and compassion. In his situation right now, before his face, bowing down before him are uh, his brothers, but these are not ordinary brothers in the eyes of God. Remember, these are the 12 tribes of Israel. God also has a plan for them, something great for them. So imagine if Joseph's heart was not right, he can actually kill, eradicate, slaughter the 12 tribes of Israel right in front of him, but he did not. Why? Because he knows in his heart, God meant it for good, and his love just overflowed to them. Let me ask you, are there people in your life that has caused you pains, scars, and wound? Maybe you would like to forgive them. In your mind, you know, I have to forgive. I know I have to move on, but somehow you can't. It's easier said than done. Joseph's recommendation is this. God meant it for good. For him, it was the ultimate answer to all the sufferings he had experienced on earth. Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, when we have faith in God's sovereignty, the phrase God meant it for good takes on a whole new meaning. It would be words of hope for you. It means you can wait on God. The phrase God meant it for you would also be words of faith for us and for you. Because you know that God, in His own ways, He can use it. He has a purpose for it. He could be saving a soul. He could be teaching a good moral value to someone. He could be correcting someone. He could be strengthening a saint. Or maybe He could be preparing someone for something great to be useful for His kingdom. If we have faith in God's sovereignty, in God's sovereignty it means Everything that he allows to happen, God meant it for good. Amen. Wherever you are, I'd like you to bow down your heads. And I'd like to have this moment of an invitation to all of us. First is if you would like to have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, then you might want to pause this video, pray to him, ask him, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin cannot save myself, come into my life, be my savior, save me. I'd like to start a personal relationship with you. You can do that. Or maybe you would like to call the number displayed on our screen and we can talk with you and explain things and help you on understanding or establishing that personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You also have to understand and remember that when you have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, it means at the end of our life here, your life here, you get to spend your life with Him. And that's a good, good thing. Or maybe you would like someone to pray for you or someone to pray with you. Call the number and let us do that. Or maybe you want to share a burden, a prayer request, or maybe a testimony. Just call us and we will be glad to hear that from you. So let us pray. Great God, we thank you for this wonderful moment that we can spend thinking about your words. Thank you, Lord, for reminding us of that great truth 
that in everything that's happening here on earth, we might not be in control, but you are. Everything that happens, you meant it for good. In your great wisdom, you're doing great things. Thank you, Lord, for giving us that peace. And I pray for everyone listening to this video, watching this video. I pray that you work on them, work in their hearts, whatever issues, whatever things they have in their heart. Make them feel your love. Make them feel your comfort. Because we know we can trust you. Thank you, Lord God. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. close this worship service in a word of prayer. Let us pray. Great mighty God, we thank you for the words of comfort we heard from your word. And I pray that this continually stay not only in our heart, and not only in our mind, but also in our heart. Thank you for allowing us to hear it, to understand it, even now, Lord God, as we process it. From today and the next few days, we pray, Lord, that you, we feel your presence. We feel your love and we thank you for you have been patient to us throughout these years, throughout these days. Thank you, Lord, for your love and protection. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding great joy to the only wise God and to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be glory and majesty, dominion and power both now and forevermore. And everybody say, Amen. 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 Praise God for His powerful and relevant message about Joseph. We can rest assured that whatever happens in our lives, even if we don't understand it, God meant it for good. Same with our situation right now. There are difficulties, but God will make a way, even where there seems to be no way. Isaiah 43, 19 says, Look, I am about to do something new. Even now, it is coming. Do you not see it? Indeed, I will make a way in the wilderness, rivers in the desert. So, like Joseph, let us rest in God and rely on His everlasting love.
So again, we are at the end of our online worship today, and we hope and pray that you have been blessed with the word, with the singing, and somehow this feeling of fellowship wherever you are. So next week again, we would like to invite you on our sixth, right, sixth online service. Time flies so fast, and I pray and hope that you have a wonderful day ahead of you. So from the Filipino ministry, I'd like to say goodbye.